Greetings and welcome to the weekly Yashiva lesson. Uh, used to be called my Sunday school lesson, but since I'm sending it out to everybody, what I would normally be teaching to my Sunday school class is what I'm sending out to everybody during this year and sticking with some Jewish topics, uh, some things that are special for the particular season of the year in which we are having the class. Uh, this is the middle part of Messiah month, um, all the lessons this month are about the Messiah, uh, totally from a Jewish context. And um, this week, I'm doing one that probably has never been done before. I know my Sunday school class and other people who know me are going to say, well, uh, that's not unusual because sometimes you say things that nobody has ever said before. But uh, the topic of this week's Yeshiva lesson is Messiah's bris. Now, if you know anything about Jewish customs, the bris, or it's called the brit also, the same Hebrew word, um, is a word that's used for the ceremony where they have the circumcision performed on the baby male Jewish child. And... Um, and then they celebrate like Baptists do. They have a meal afterwards. Um, it's a time of naming. It's a time of blessing. It's a time of circumcision. And we're going to, um, you know, I, anytime circumcision is mentioned um, from the pulpit, every man in the crowd silently quivers a little bit. Uh, but it's amazing what God's purpose was in giving this as a sign of his covenant. Um, you'll see it's, it's, uh, it's very significant what God did, the promises he made to his people, and because of them, some of those promises also carry over to us, and that's a blessing. Some of the promises are unique for Israel and his people, Jew the Jewish people. Some of them are for them, and we get to share in them, not in their place, but along with them as adopted sons of Abraham. Um, Genesis chapter 17, also I have sent in the announcement about this, uh, where this was going to appear and what the name of this lesson was. I sent out some brief notes, if you want to print those out or follow along in, in your computer, however you want to do it. Uh, something that might help you to retain the information a little bit better. Uh, first of all, the background of circumcision, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 14. Abraham was 99 years old. He was still waiting for God's promise to be fulfilled about him having a son. And at the age of 99, the Lord comes. And if you look down through this passage, I'm not going to have time to read all of it. But seven times the Lord mentions the word covenant. The word covenant literally means a cutting not only was it a cutting of the Jewish male child, but uh, to seal a covenant between two adult individuals, an animal was killed. And it sort of sounds gross, but the animal was split down the middle and the parts of the body were separated. And the two people would walk through the middle of the animal and they were committing themselves to the covenant that was sealed with blood in this case. Uh, the picture, the significance of it was that they were serious about this. He wouldn't lightly take the life of an animal. So the background of, of um, cutting covenants even appears before the covenant of circumcision. And God told Abraham, Abram, and he later named him in this chapter Abraham, that his descendants would have an outward physical sign that they were under the covenant that God was making with Abraham. Um, it was, circumcision was, and if you see it in these, in these verses, it was a sign of God's promise. Uh, God said, this is a sign, a physical sign, and we know that it was an important physical sign. For example, in Egypt, when Pharaoh's daughter found the baby Moses wrapped in uh, clothes and in the little boat in the bulrushes. Uh, apparently he was crying. Apparently he needed to be changed, I'm presuming now. But she said he is a child of the Hebrews. He's a Jewish boy. Well, how could she tell that? She could tell it because he was circumcised. 
So uh, there was something about it. In fact, during the, the days of Jesus and um, up in Rome, there were uh, places where that was the way they could tell who they were going to kill as a Jewish person and who they weren't. So it was a serious thing, this um, act of circumcision, but it was a sign of God's promise. It was a sign that the father who had his child circumcised, in this case, Abraham, um, doing it to himself and to the, all the adults in his household, it was a sign that they were accepting God's promise, God's covenant. Um, it was a sign that they would teach it to their children. Deuteronomy 6 talks about teaching all of the, uh, the statutes and the commandments of God to the children. It was a sign that they were receiving it, including the benefits of the covenant that God was giving them. Uh, as I said, he uses that word, a serious word. I use it as uh, the word... I think a very critical, serious word during marriage, that marriage is a covenant, that it is not a promise, it's a covenant. And the covenant was sealed by death, in this case, the death of the animal. And I state that a husband and wife seal this covenant by dying to themselves and living unto the Lord first and then to the other person. So the word covenant fits so well into the marriage uh, ceremony, uh, way better than the word promise. What was God's covenant promise? Chapter 12 of Genesis, he told them he would give them a land, and he exactly gives the parameters, the definition, the geographical boundaries of that land multiple times in Scripture. Um, he promised to give them a family, a legacy. Um, they would be the descendants of Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob's descendants. That was the family of promise. Isaac was the son of promise. Jacob was the son of promise. And Abraham received that promise from God of a land, a blessing, um, a seed, a family. And the seed promise also included the seed of the Messiah from back in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman. So, <laughs> excuse me, in some of the other restatements of the covenant, he talks about to, to David, he says, as part of this Abrahamic covenant, uh, you and your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel. So um, it was a time that uh, people um, attached themselves to this covenant of God. Um, let's think about um, this idea of the four purposes of circumcision. There were four important purposes for circumcision to be done. First of all, public association as a son of the covenant. The mother and the father were associating their baby who was being circumcised they were associating with him with the covenant of God and saying, our son is a son of this covenant. Secondly, it was a public announcement of the name. Uh, we're going to turn over right now, if you've got your Bibles there, to Luke chapter 1. Um, the time of circumcision in uh, Bible days was a time also of the naming, the giving of a Hebrew name to the child. And uh, we see that in uh, Luke chapter 1. Uh, but the public announcement of a name happens in Luke 1, verse 59. We read about John, um, Johanan, the son of Elizabeth and Zacharias, uh, receives his name, verse 59. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. Well, what's significant about the eighth day? Leviticus 14, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 12 talks about the eighth day. On the eighth day, the child would be circumcised, every male child that came from the womb of a Jewish woman. Um, and they would have called him. So along with the circumcision, there was the naming. And they were going to name him Zecharias, um, or another name that Zecharias had attached to himself. But his mother answered and said, No, he shall be called Yohanan, John. But they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to the father what he would have him called. Now, this is funny. Uh, Zacharias couldn't talk. And uh, 
So they, they started making signs to him. Well, he could see. Um, I, I don't know what the, where they were writing or what, but he could hear, uh, but he just couldn't talk. But these guys started making signs to him about what the sun would be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, his name is Yohanan, John. So they all marveled. They were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, praising God. How, how awesome that the first words out of his mouth after a lengthy time of not being able to speak. Because he couldn't speak, he couldn't serve in the temple. After he came out and was unable to speak, he couldn't go back in and serve in the temple. He had already done his temple rotation as a priest, but he couldn't do anything in the temple area because of this infirmity that he had that he couldn't speak. So the first words out of his mouth, he sings a worship song to God. Maybe one of the Psalms, I don't know, but you read what he says a little bit later here. Fear came on all those who dwelt around them. And all these sayings, verse 65, were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. All those who heard them, that is, heard the things that he was singing, heard the things that he was saying to praise God. When they heard these things, they kept them in their hearts. And they said, what kind of child is this? <laughs> Apparently, Zechariah not only began to praise God, but began to bless his son. We read what he says about his son down in verse 76. He says to his son. Now, we don't, I'm presuming that what he said about his son, the things that they were marveling at, which are not recorded here, were amazing things that God had shown him about his son about the place that his son was going to have in the presentation of the Messiah. So uh, it's not told earlier what he says about the future of his son, but it's amazing, and people are, are just blown away with it. Well, the exact words that he says to his son, he say, well, this is a baby, okay? Yeah, it's a baby. Publicly, people need to hear this blessing upon the son. They know the son was wanted when they hear these words of blessing. Um, it was a sad day when my grandfather, my grandfather who was not a believer at the time, told my mother that he didn't want her. When she was born, he wanted her to be a boy. He needed boys to work the farm. So he did the opposite of a blessing. Um, he told her she wasn't wanted. Now, later on, he came to the Lord and he made that right with her at the age of 70, that he did want her, that he was wrong and he shouldn't have said those things. But he says to his son, you child will be called the prophet of the highest. Now, all the people are hearing this too. These are some of the things they were amazed about. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. They knew that this was a messianic passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, and I believe it was Isaiah 60. So, what he was saying was, he was interpreting this prophecy and saying, my son is going to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. You are going to come to prepare the way of the Lord, he says to his son, to give knowledge of salvation of Yeshua to his people. His son was going to present Yeshua, Jesus, to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. Um, he, he blesses his son, and that's, that's part of uh, the purposes of this circumcision time. This brisk ceremony is it's a time of blessing, a time of lifting up um, the child. It's also a time of giving a, a, a sacrifice or an offering. And the words are used interchangeably sometimes. Usually in Scripture, the difference between sacrifice and offering is that sacrifice um, had to do with uh, the giving of blood, except there were two living sacrifices. Romans chapter 12 references them, and Leviticus chapter 13 and 16 reference them also. But there were certain um, sacrifices that were to be given after the birth of a son. 
Now, back in uh, Leviticus chapter, um, let's see, I've got it written down here. Leviticus chapter 12 says that on the eighth day at the circumcision and on the 40th day, uh, if a woman had a male child, the days of her purification uh, were 40. If she had a female child, the days of her purification went up to 66. There was a sacrifice to be given at the eighth day at the circumcision. It was supposed to be a lamb. Um, if you couldn't afford a lamb, then you could do two turtle doves or two pigeons. Apparently, from what we read in Luke, uh, that was the sacrifice for those who could not afford a lamb. And it's presumed that Mary and Joseph didn't have much money at the time of the circumcision. They did two years later when the Magi came and brought them gifts, including gold, but they didn't have much money now. Uh, Joseph had left his job, and they traveled all this way, and they, uh, they were there for the census and presumably also for the paying of taxes. So uh, this son that is blessed by Zacharias as part of the circumcision ceremony, uh, that's what happened to Jesus, not only from his parents, but also from some others. So um, the, this blessing thing, the announcing of the name, but the blessing, there were four parts of the blessing. Um, I don't want to miss these. They're very important. The first is meaningful touch. It's interesting in the blessing of Jesus, you see that uh, Simeon holds him in his hands. He touches him. He lifts him up. Um, very important. We know now uh, medically that's very important emotionally for children to be held, for children to be to be held closely, uh, for children to be kept warm. They come from uh, 98 to 100 degree fluid. They're born into this cold world. Um, in fact, some places now put them into warm water, the same temperature that the womb was. But the first thing that's done is a child is brought to his parents to be held by them. And uh, scientists know that, and doctors know that at a very early age, that baby begins to associate smells with different people. Um, the baby can feel the difference between the father's rough hands and the mother's smooth hands uh, nowadays. So there's an important thing to this meaningful touch. It's the first uh, component of the blessing that's very important. And these are Old Testament and New Testament principles. Secondly, spoken words of affirmation. We've already talked about those. Um, John affirmed his son and his son's value and his son's worth to other people and to his son. And if he did this to this baby, I am sure that he did it later on. Um, it's important that a child be affirmed and hear positive words about him, about his person. Not just about what he does, but himself as a person. Thirdly, prediction of a bright future. Uh, and that's what Zacharias did. Zacharias said, my boy's going to announce the coming of the Messiah. Yeah, he said, well, yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, but what's the difference? Um, you can look at a child. You can look at a young child and see the, the things that God's put into that child's life. You can affirm that child. Uh, you can say to that child things that are true, but things that you see that that child wouldn't be able to see right now because you're older and you're more mature and wiser. Um, but to say to them, you, can, you say to any young man, you're going to be as tall as your dad someday. And they'll go, yeah. You say to any young girl, you are beautiful like your mother, and you are going to be beautiful when you are her age too. And there's a smile. That's a blessing to say to someone, you're going to make it. It's going to be good. You're going to be a great at what you do. You do your best. And that's what God expects us to do. The best with the tools that he has given us. The fourth component of a blessing 
is a personal commitment by the blesser to help to see that come to pass. Um, you're going to you're going to become a great speaker in the future. You know how to talk already. You're not afraid of people. I'm going to help you learn to organize your thoughts and present them to other people. Um, you know what? You've got strong hands. I'm going to teach you how to use these tools that you already have such a, an affinity for. You might you love tools, a little child. You love to fix things. I'm going to teach you how to do that. You're going to be the best car mechanic in the world in the future someday. And I'm going to help you. And so that's what the blessing is. It's meaningful touch, positive words of affirmation. Um, not like um, what Shakespeare say, um, and it was a scornful thing to damn someone with faint praise because flattery or faint praise equals a lie. It's not the truth. It's a manipulative thing. But to say to somebody, you, know, you are an honorable person. You're not a perfect person. None of us are except for Jesus. But I see characteristics in you that, that remind me of him so much. Those are things that will build up a person's heart. And that's what happened to, that's what Zacharias did to John the Baptist. Maybe there were some people there that heard what he said so that when John the Baptist went out into the wilderness and, and trained in the Essene camp, learned the Old Testament scriptures and began to preach, when people heard who he was, they said, hey, this guy, his dad said he was going to be the one that announced coming to the Messiah. We better get out there. Because this guy's going to be great. Um, it affects other people, not only the person that you're blessing, but it affects other people around them. Um, so um, the four purposes of the ceremony included blessing and then offerings. But um, all right, let's look in, in chapter two as we finish up here. Chapter two, let's look at Messiah's bris. Let's look at his circumcision time and the time of blessing. Chapter two, verses 21 to 38. Um, when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yeshua, Jesus, a name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. <coughs> I'm trying to think. I, I, don't, I can't think of anybody else in scripture that was named by an angel. Now God named some people, but Gabriel went to Mary, went to Joseph, and said, call his name Yeshua. Gabriel also named John the Baptist, said to Zacharias, you're going to call him John. And I don't know how Zacharias communicated that to Elizabeth, but before Zacharias could speak, and they said, we're going to call him Zacharias, she said, no, 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 his name is going to be John. So then being the chauvinist that they were, they said, well, what does dad say about this? And dad said, he wrote it, Yohanan. Bingo. He's able to talk. It's amazing. So this happens. Jesus is given this name by his parents, and um, he is blessed by the giving of the name. He is also blessed by, you think of this, the giving of sacrifices, Um they come in and give a sacrifice on the eighth day. Uh, in the same passage, they came back at the 40th day and gave the sacrifice for her purification. The sacrifice that they gave signified that she had had a male child. And every Jewish woman who had a male child held this hope in their hearts that maybe their son would be the Messiah. Especially, well, it should have been only the women who had sons that were of the tribe of Judah. But um, her sacrifice on the 40th day, people said, oh, you had a boy, huh? Whoa, cool. Maybe the Messiah. Um, and they called his name Jesus, uh, the salvager, the rescuer. Um, his circumcision is in verse 21. His naming is also in verse 21. Um, again, named by Gabriel. But his parents said, that's it. 
That's what he's going to be called. Um, the offering that was given for him in 24, I mentioned this earlier, was the, was the uh, let's say it was the low-end offering. Not less important, but less expensive. Verse 24, they offered a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Um, so they did it exactly as it was said in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8. Then they gave the blessing. Um, Simeon comes in, takes Jesus in his arms, and blessed God, and raises him up and says, Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen your Yeshua. His naming, I don't know if he heard when they said what his name was when he was circumcised. Um, by the way, I sort of had a funny thought today. Um, the Christmas song, Away in a Manger, says that, um, that Jesus, uh, no crying he made. Um, I bet he did some crying on the eighth day, and the reason is obvious. But uh, by the way, I think he did cry earlier. Because there's nothing sinful about a child crying to let the parents know that he's either hungry or he needs a new diaper. Those are normal things that can be done by a child. There's no sin involved, no sin nature involved in a child crying that way. Um, this, when he came by the Spirit into the temple and he holds up the baby and says, You've let me see your Yeshua, your Jesus a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Same word that's used about the reaction of the people who heard Zacharias bless the baby Johanan, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist, and talk about his bright future. Um, the same thing when this man whom they didn't know comes in, knows who their baby is, knows his name, and knows what he's going to do. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the disappointment or rejection, that's the word fall, and the rising, the resurrection of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Now, he blesses him first, but then he says, But it's not all going to be happy, happy times in the future for you or for this boy, this one who is the Son of God. Um, just sort of wrapping it up, the, the blessing 28 to 32, verse 34, verse 36 to 38, when Anna comes in, she does the same thing. She blesses by telling everybody what God has done and what he's going to do through this baby, Yeshua, Jesus. In closing, think about a couple of things. Think about the Genesis 12 blessing. God said to Abraham and to all of his descendants, um, I will bless you. I'll give you a land. I'll give you a family. I'll give you a legacy of a king, a Messiah. I will bless those who bless you. And those are non-Jewish people. I will, through you, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. Have you ever thought about how? I mentioned this in a daily matzah last week. Uh, what are some of the blessings that come to us as non-Jewish people through the Jewish people? The Word of God? Wow. God used His people to write it, preserve it. Um, I, I mean, they people of detail in recording the Word of God. Um, he used them big time to bring the word of God to us. The Messiah. There's no Gentile Messiah. There was only one Messiah. He's Jewish. We're allowed to believe in him. He would be a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. But because of them, we have the blessing of the word of God. We have the blessing of of all the physical blessings today, agriculture, medicine, there's no medical procedure that you and I have. There's no medicine that you and I have that is not in some way or another touched heavily 
by Jewish hands, Jewish thinking, Jewish mind, development of technology, agriculture. Um, the whole world is blessed to the Jewish people, and they are so hated. And it is so much upon us to love them, to bless them, to advocate for them. And finally, in closing, think about this thing of the blessing. Have you blessed your kids? It's not too late if they're alive. Have you blessed your grandkids? Have you looked for other people who did not receive a blessing? It's easy to tell. Here's one way to tell. They're looking down on you. Have you said, Lord, I want to be a blessing to those people. I want to bless them, to tell them sincerely, affirming, blessing things about them, the things that I see in their life, uh, the future that I see for them, the fact that I am willing to do what I can and what's necessary to help them achieve that wonderful future, blessing God and being blessed by Him. Um, the bris was important for, especially for the matter of blessing. God's made a covenant with His people. He's made it into a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, that we can be his people also. And he has left it in our hands to bless others as he has shown us in his word. And he has blessed us also. May we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for reminders through these passages of the awesomeness of words, positive words, affirming words, affirming touch. Um, coming alongside and helping and trying to, to be um, an impactor, an influencer in somebody's life the way that you have in our lives. Thank you for that. Help us to look for someone this week to bless. Look for someone to affirm, to come alongside so that they may know how their Heavenly Father feels about them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.